everyone, and welcome to the finals of the StarCityGames.com Dallas Open Weekend, part of Season 2 of the 2018 SCD Tour, brought to you by Twitch and Ultimate Guard. Cedric Phillips and Todd Anderson here in the booth. Nick Miller down there in the feature match area. Going to give these players the green light as we are going to prepare to watch Tanner Grace, Ross Merriam, and Brendan DeCandio. That's Team BCW on your left against David Thomas, Brian Basako, and Jonathan Job on your right. A fist bump, good sportsmanship, and we are underway as Tanner Grace is going to start things off with a ponder. Grace on Grixis Delver, a deck that he has played for some time now. David Thomas on Blue Black Death Shadow. The breakout deck at Pro Tour 25th anniversary in the hands of Josh Utter Layton. And while David Thomas is no Raptor, he's pretty darn good in his own right. Yeah, uh, we. this is actually a flip-flop of what we saw earlier. Uh, David Thomas was on the play the, uh, their first time around, and his start of Cycle Street Wraith plus Reanimate put him low enough so he could cast a turn two Death Shadow, but also just had a 3-4 threat early in the game that doesn't die to Lightning Bolt, and effectively is unblockable thanks to Underground Sea. Now he's on the draw. Things uh, could go a lot differently as the texture of the game changes based on play and draw. Well, David Thomas is going to start things off by sacrificing Misty Rainforest. And that'll get him in Underground C. In matchups where you don't take a lot of damage um, from your opponent, you know, it's important to have Watery Grave in your deck, and we see that with three copies versus only two Underground Seas. Uh, that way you can effectively turn on your Death Shadows. But if you want to use Snuff Out, if you want to cycle Street Wraith, if you want to cast Thought Seas, you have to manage your life total carefully because if you take too much damage, you can just die to a True Name Nemesis or a, a Stray Lightning Bolt. This will be a Thought Seas by David Thomas targeting Tan and Grace. We'll see how Grace wants to respond here. Grace might be thinking days, but instead he'll show the hand. There's a spell pierce. Let's make it two of them along with the days. An Inquisition of Kozak, a Gurmag Angler, and a Brainstorm here for Tan and Grace. Thomas will write down the contents of the grip. So unless David has a very good card that he wants to protect from Inquisition of Kozilek, uh, this Thought Seize is very likely going to take Brainstorm, simply because the rest of the hand is just very reactive. And we see that decision made, Brainstorm down. Brainstorm, maybe the most powerful card in that hand. Going to go to the graveyard now as we head back over to Tan and Grace. Grace is going to play a Ponder. That will resolve. Top couple of cards. See if Grace finds what he's looking for. Looks like uh, Wasteland in there, which doesn't help him actually make land drops here too well. But if he's able to hit that Underground Sea from uh, David Thomas, it might stunt his growth early on. Uh, we saw Wasteland play a huge role in this matchup previously, as well as any sort of Delver v. Delver matchup. Long ponder here for Tan, no pun intended, but this is a very big decision for him, especially for what he's looking to accomplish here on the SCD Tour. Ponder is done resolving. He's going to wasteland that underground sea, hoping that perhaps David Thomas doesn't have another land. Wasteland, you back. Yeah, okay. that's bad for Tannen because I'm pretty sure that Wasteland was the only land on top. He gambled a little bit, hoping that uh, David didn't have a Wasteland. I'm pretty sure he had a ponder on uh, as the second card down. Watery Grave, untapped, Delver of Secrets. Grace has no mana. David Thomas does not have an Insectile Aberration just yet. He'll play a Marsh Flats. We're going to see an attack here in just a moment, I'm sure, but first he's going to sacrifice that Marsh Flats, fall down to 14, potentially 12 if he wants that other copy of Watery Grave. We could see a Death Shadow show up here very quickly, Todd. Yeah, uh, 12 is the threshold for being able to resolve a Death Shadow without it dying to its own ability. Uh... You know, that's why the deck plays Watery Grave. That's why the deck plays Thought Seas. Even Force of Will helps push you towards that end. Uh, we've seen uh, newer versions of the deck, uh, popularized by Josh Sutter Layton at Pro Tour 20th Anniversary, using even Reanimate on things like Street Wraith to deal yourself large chunks of damage because getting under 12 is a huge priority. This will be a ponder here from David Thomas. He's taking a look at a couple of cards. See if he likes what he finds. <coughs> Day is a huge card here, just in general, because Tana is so low on mana and resources. Thomas has taken a long ponder as well. Looking to stop Operation, get Tana a trophy. <laughs> Funny to note, Tana and Grace, Brian Basako, they drove together for this tournament. Nice. Well, there seems to be six cards in the graveyard for David Thomas, as well as a Gurmag Angler in hand, and that is one of the better threats in the matchup because it doesn't die to Lightning Bolt. There is a Gurmag Angler. 
Tannen Grace is going to go with a force of will. <laughs> Street Wraith here from David. David's so smart because there, he knows there's days, days top. right there. Yes, he Hell does. Hell yes, there is. That is going to put the Watery Grave back in the hand. Days will take care of that. And now Watery Grave is going to – I think he already played a land for the turn, so I don't think he can play that land. Yeah, well, well I'm pretty sure he played a land this turn. He fetched for the, the, the second uh, Watery Grave. Correct. So we'll get that fixed. No harm, no foul. Tana Grace is going to draw. He needs a land right now. He found a young Pyromancer, not what he's looking for. And if this young Pyromancer, excuse me, if this Delver flips, which it will, I think we're just about done here, as this is going to be attack here for eight, reanimate in hand. I don't think he really wants to reanimate Street Wraith. That's five damage, which is a lot. But uh, it does present lethal next turn, putting 11 power on the battlefield. So yeah, I see, eh, I see no problem with this. And uh, he does have some protection here with Force of Will if uh, Tana has Lightning Bolt, but Tana gets a little lucky. And it has uh, Lightning Bolt plus Force will back up. Oh, oh, this makes it a little bit makes easier. Makes it easy. Death Shadow. No reanimate shenanigans. David Thomas going to win game number one here over Tan and Grace. Blue Black Death Shadow going to pick up game number one here over Grixis Delver. You also see that Jonathan Job is currently up a game here with Bat Nexus over Brendan DeCandio playing Black Blue Midrange. So Team BCW has got their back against the wall right now. So we will take a look here at the sideboards very quickly. Let's start with Tan and Grace, who's got two Diabolic Edict, two Abraid, two Pyroblast, two Surgical Extraction, seven one ofs, Price of Progress, Null Rod, Marsh Casualties, Pithing Needle, Grim Lava Mancer, Lillian, The Last Hope, and a Flusterstorm. So this is going to be an all-out slugfest. We've, we've seen uh, tempo games where Wasteland was hugely important. Uh, game one here and the last time they played in game one. Uh, however, I think it's going to be more of an overall resource battle where each player just tries to answer the threats that the other one plays. Uh, you're going to see a lot of jockeying for position, getting a creature on the battlefield and trying to protect it with things like Daze or Force of Will, uh, as well as just generic answers like Diabolic Edict. So I think Tannen uh, is going to be bringing in uh, Diabolic Edict, probably a Braid. Uh, even though it only kills Delver of Secrets, Delver is a big deal. Um, you know, it's possible that he doesn't want to overload on that effect, though, because he already has four bolts main deck. Pyroblast is great, being able to stop a Delver as well as countering the best card in the format in uh, uh, Brainstorm, as well as winning battles over Force of Will when Force of Will is trying to target one of your bigger threats. Uh, I don't like Surgical Extraction or Price of Progress. Even though Price of Progress can maybe nick a game, uh, David doesn't really have to play more than uh, you know two lands at a time. So I think most of the time it's only going to do about four damage, and it's going to do just as much damage to Tannen. And it's going to be a, a battle over Wasteland as well. So the odds of it doing much of anything is pretty low until uh, it ends the game. On the side of things here for David Thomas, three Dreaded Knight, three Surgical Extraction, two Hymn to Torak, two Liliana, the Last Hope, two Throne of Geth, a Diabolic Edict. Nice spell by man, kaboom, and Engineered Explosives. Um, I don't like much from the side of David Thomas. I think Last Hope is going to come in on both sides as just a, a generic grindy card. Uh, Last Hope is much better from David's side because it can uh, nick a young Pyromancer. But uh, as far as Tannen goes, he's usually just going to use it to, to bring back his creatures that die. I like Dobbok Edict, and I like him to Turok, and I like trying to one-for-one -to -one, one -one your opponents to death. Well, those are the options there for both players. Do you want to correct a mistake very quickly here, too? Jonathan Job and Brandon DeCandio are still playing. So the only game result that we do have right now is the one you just watched there between David Thomas and Tannen Grace. Apologies for the confusion there. But one thing we can clear you up on is where you can get an awesome new play mat here. You like that transition? What are you yeah. laughing about? You're just so good at it. <laughs> September 29th and the 30th. Ah, you can go to go.starcitygames.com slash pre-release where you can get Meals on Steel. Some of our members are our Creature Collection, the Hippo, the Kraken, and so many more. Exclusive play mat available at participating stores, and you can find a participating store for a Guilds of Ravnica play mat at go.starcitygames.com slash pre-release. And remember, keep it casual with that pre-release. Have some fun. Get some new players into the game. And Guilds of Ravnica should be a really awesome set anyway, so it'll be a great opportunity to play some Magic and get an awesome play mat while doing so. Plus, Standard will probably be great once Kaladesh rotates. So you'll pick up a bunch of great Standard cards. There you go. Woo. Keeping it positive. I like it. Also, if you're a fan of Shocklands and, and Modern, you know, this is going to be a great time to, to bring the prices down for those, and you can pick those up on the cheap, maybe trade for some at your local pre-release when they get opened in people's seal pools. Will underscore J04, currently streaming SD Tour Finals on my laptop and watching hashtag SummerSlam 2018 at the same time. I feel like at Cedric A. Phillips will be proud. I am proud. Nice. I am proud. Just your, your brands are just everywhere. Uh, everywhere. You wrestling, you magics. Yeah, ultimate gods. Everywhere. Just do it all. I hope SummerSlam is great, even though it's going to be super medium. 
just lock it up. It's seven hours long. Nothing should be that long. Um, magic tournaments are way longer. Nothing should be willingly that long. If magic tournament could be, no, see, a magic tournament is that long because like it kind of has to be. But if a magic tournament could be like four hours, I think everyone would do it. They're willingly having SummerSlam be seven hours long. Yeah, I really miss daily events. Do you? I what do. Were the, what were dailies? I don't remember. Just four rounds. Is that and it? you got prize based on your, your rounds. But, you know, after you finish your round, you had like 20 or 30 minutes to watch a TV show in between rounds. It was great. That was dope. Now that they have leagues, I just feel obligated to play my next match. I'm so used to I can't stop in the middle of a league. It's bad. Yeah, I know. I don't know. I think it's because I've been playing Magic Online for like 15 years, but I'm just like, I have three more matches to play. Yeah. And it's like, I could just leave. No, I can't. Half the time, I just, like, play two matches, then I watch an episode of a TV show, and then I come back, and I'm like, hey, I'm just done for the day. Got my two matches in. I'm prepared for this tournament. And then I'll come back, like, Tuesday or Wednesday. I'll log back in. It's like, uh, you have to finish this league. I'm like, nah, just drop. <laughs> play, in, <laughs> play another league in a different format. I'm really glad I'm not the only one who's like, I have to finish when I start a league. Because I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do a league for tonight. And then, I, and then I just play all five matches. I've dropped a 2-1 before. That is maniacal behavior. I just don't care. I, I, that's obvious, given that you're dropping a 2-1. Yeah. Well, if I still if I think my deck's bad, it's more valuable to, to play test, uh, you know, the different formats or different matchups, you know. Brian Bisacco, he wins game number one there over Ross Marin, the Human's Mirror, currently see if he can to the break, player on the right. See if he can break that curse of Ross Marin being the only person to beat him in a Human's Mirror on the SCG Tour. Well, here we go. Game number two about to be underway here between Tan and Grace and David Thomas. Tan and Grace going to be on the play. These players will take a look at their opening hands here in just a moment. Do keep in mind as well, folks, that next weekend the SCD Tour heads to Charm City. That's Baltimore, Maryland. Should be a lot of fun there. Modern Open. Going to be very well attended, as all of our Baltimore events are, right down there in the Inner Harbor. And if you're a baseball fan, I believe that the Baltimore Orioles, who are truly horrible, will be in town. <laughs> And the tickets Let's just insult everyone from Baltimore. <laughs> and the tickets will Whee! be cheap. You know what's great about a bad baseball team? The tickets are cheap. They're still like, you know, they still win like 30 or 40 games a year because there's like 140 games. Well, that's roughly the number of wins that the Baltimore Orioles currently have. That's how bad they are. Great. Like if they're if if you're if you're a 500 team, you win 81. If you win half your game to an 81, they are going to win way less than that. They play 162 games? That's right. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. They're 37 and 87. Those tickets are like five bucks, dude. 37 and 87. That's bad. I hope the beer's cheap. That, everything's cheap. It better be. Baltimore. Otherwise, no one's coming. Thought C is going to show you a hand of ponder. Uh, Fatal Push, Gurmag, Angler, Delver, Secrets in a couple of lands there included Delta, Scalding Tarn, and Marsh Flats. Yeah, Thoughtseize is actually a great spell from Tannen here on the first turn. It's one of the easier ways for his deck to actually deal with a Gurmag Angler. However, based on the texture of his hand, it's possible that a, a Delver of Secrets on turn one could be uh, more detrimental to the potential success of, of uh, him in this game. Well, Delver Secret's going to bite the dust here, it looks like, to the thoughts. These Tannen says, I want to play some more turns, if I could. Scalding Tarn will be sacrificed here by David Thomas. I'm imagining an underground sea to start as opposed to Water Grave, but we'll see what Thomas opts to do. Yeah, it's clear that he drew uh, something to do here. His hand was like Fatal Push, Gurmag, and some lands, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he wants to deal himself a little bit of damage because he doesn't have Street Wraith, doesn't have Thoughtseize. And if he draws a Death Shadow, he wants to be low enough so he can actually get it onto the battlefield. Uh, but what I want to talk about really is the Thoughtseize on the Delver of Secrets. I think that signifies a few things from Tannen's side. I think, A, it means he doesn't have a day, so he couldn't have countered on turn one. B, I don't think he has a removal spell for it early on, and it could just chunk him for a large chunk of damage. And C, Tannen actually has an answer to the Gurmag Angler, and whether that's something like Diabolic Edict, or just like Young Pyromancer slash uh, True Name Nemesis uh, is, is yet to be seen. Ponder here. Thomas's opener after the thought sees not great, not a ton to do. A little bit defensive with the fatal push and just the slow Gurmag angler. Uh, drew the ponder and is looking to find something like brainstorm here to get rid of some of those excess lands. Pass that turn back. Let's go over to Tan and Grace. It's a flooded strand. It's a ponder. So this is a game where Tannen knows that. 
David has access to a bunch of mana, and uh, his spells are all relatively cheap. And even though he has Wasteland in hand, uh, and he could just take David off of the one land he has on the battlefield, it's more important for Tannen to develop his mana uh, than it is to Wasteland off of David off of a land, because even though it takes off the battlefield and slows him down next turn, he has enough lands to actually play Magic for the rest of the game. Ponder's unresolving. Pass the turn back. I do think that in this matchup, Tannen is probably the control deck. I'll, I'll agree with that. I think he wants to play the longer game because he wants to get a card like True Name Nemesis established, things of that nature. Um, I do think that Tannen has the ability to win a shorter game because he has a Delver of Secrets deck, so he can, of course, do the Delver Wasteland, har har, you lose draws. But for the most part, I think he wants to be the slower deck, uh, grind out advantages with the Young Pyromancer and True Name Nemesis and try to win the game that way. <laughs> Oh, this is a big draw from David Thomas here. He found a street race, and if he has a fetch land, he's able to cast Gurmag Angler this turn. The real question is, does he want to play around days or not? And I think he does not. Well, he's going to sacrifice this Marsh Flats. We'll see what land he wants to get here again. Watery Grave and Underground Sea are the options. Grave, of course, will deal him more damage. Turn on Death Shadow. Mirror what I said about that thoughts he's taking the Delver Secrets, and he probably doesn't have days in hand. Mm -hmm. I think David thinks the same thing. Well, David's going to get himself an Underground Sea here, so he's not going to deal himself too much damage this go-around. No, he wants to make sure that if he draws, like, another Thought Seize, a Snuff Out, or a Street Wraith, he has enough life to actually use it without putting too much pressure on his life total. Looks like he's going to go towards Reanimate on Street Wraith. Yeesh! And again, Street Wraith being reanimated, it's going to bring David Thomas's life total lower for Death Shadow. It gives him a 3-4 threat. There is a Daze there. So Tannen with a daze? I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess he just didn't want to daze the Delver. That's fine. Maybe he found the daze off of, off of the Ponder. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe he's also fine uh, getting daze there just because it means there's no threat of a True Name Nemesis on the following turn. Uh, and there's a potential he could actually just race True Name Nemesis with uh, Street Wraith versus the, uh, the Swamp, uh, the Underground Sea from Tannen's side. Being at a pretty low life total, though, that's a, a dangerous prospect. This Death Shadow deck is not easy to play. Uh, figuring out which lands to fetch early on is actually <laughs> pretty important. Uh, making sure you don't take too much damage in some spots. Uh, making sure you get your life total low enough for Death Shadow. It's a, it's a dangerous dance. It'll be a Grim Law of Mancer into a preordain here for Tan and Grace. Tannen has found his card, and we're going to head back over to David Thomas. DT will draw. He'll play a Pluto Delta. He'll sack that Pluto Delta. We'll see how low he wants to go. Again, at 13 right now, could go down to 11 if he'd like to. You know what this is? Nope. Pretty sure it's a little on a last hope. That's a good magic card right now. Uh, fetching three here. I mean, he could be uh, going like Gurmag into Death Shadow. This is a very fast fetch without thinking too much, and usually when you have a fetch land, you like to save it for the likes of Ponder and Brainstorm. So he's definitely using all three mana this turn. I'm very curious what it is. Fatal Push is going to go after Grimag, or excuse me, going to go after Grim Lava Man. It's not Grimag Angler. Follow up. That's the Grimag Angler I yep. meant to say. So, going to delve away six cars, Angler on the battlefield. Yep, plays around days. And then, ooh, he's got a Death Shadow in hand too. This is it's going to be tough for Tannen. Yeah, it's a threat heavy draw here for David Thomas. He does have a Death Shadows backup let out with that Delver of Secrets maybe as bait. Tannen's going to sacrifice his copy of Scalding Tarn, get himself a Volcanic Island. Curious to see if he has a three-mana spell that he'd like to play this turn, like maybe a True Name Nemesis. It appears that's not the case. He's going to go towards Young Pyromancer. That will resolve. This will be a Lightning Bolt. That'll take care of the Delver. Ross Merriam Elemental Token onto the battlefield. That'll probably do a nice job of checking the Gurmag Angler, at least for the moment. Yeah, I mean, the, the tokens from Young Pyromancer are pivotal in keeping Gurmag Angler and even Large Death Shadows in check. However, Fatal Push off the top for David Thomas is going to wreck that plan quite nicely. Gurmag Angler going to come in. It looks like Tannen's going to take this first hit. Doesn't have any interest in blocking with the Elemental Token just yet. We're all tied. Never mind, I take it back. Looks like he will block. So, Grace will stay at 16. 
And now here is Death Shadow getting a Water Grave, and David Thomas falling down even a little bit lower to make that Death Shadow a little bit larger. Yeah, and that's going to keep it out of Lightning Bolt range. If he just fetched down to 10, it would be a 3-3, and any Lightning Bolt from Tana would be able to take care of it. Now it's a 5-5, yes, two very large threats on the battlefield that uh, are really, really tough for him to get off the table. I think this is going to be a common occurrence in the Death Shadow versus Grixis Delver matchups where you just see the threats from the Death Shadow deck just being too big for the, the Lightning Bolts and such to deal with. There's a Wasteland follow-up. That's a Delver of Secrets, and now this is a Diabolic Edict. That's a good start. Diabolic Edict taking care of the Gurmag Angler. Pass the turn back. It's a snuff out, and that is going to... That's it. Pan the life. That is going to do it. Yikes. David Thomas going to win this game and match here over Tannen Grace. That's one up there for the team of Thomas, Basako, and Job. It's on Miriam and DeCandio now to get the job done. Seems like a tough matchup there for Tannen. And now we prepare to move over to Modern, where we're going to watch Ross Miriam and Brian Basako. They are in game number two of Humans Mirror, and we'll see where things do stand here. Looks like Ross might be a little bit ahead right now. Checking in on this game state. I see Mantis Rider, and it looks like a Phantasmal image that's copied a Mantis Rider. Over there for Merriam, a Bugler, a Meddling Mage, which will confirm what it's naming. I see a Champion of the Parish with three counters on it and a Noble Hierarch. Looks like Ross is just resolving the Bugler right now, and he's opted to take a Hostage Taker. Yeah, uh, Ross, I think, is in pretty good shape here. Uh, Basoko is, is down to uh, eight already. Um, wow, this is this is tough. Melee Mage is naming Reflector Mage. That image on Brian Brasaco's side is a Mantis Rider. You saw that Militia Bugler take a hostage, hostage take. taker. And now we're going to see an attack here. It looks like with Meddling Mage plus Exalted. Not sure Champion of the Parish wants to attack instead because a double block could take place. Hard to say exactly, exactly what Ross wants to do, but we'll find out. Honestly, if I'm Ross, I'm fine trading uh, my Champion of the Parish for one of the Mantis Riders just because I feel like the easiest way to lose this game for Ross is if another Mantis Rider or Phantasmal Image comes down and threatens to kill him in two turns with a block next turn. This will be a Cavern of Souls. We'll see what this is naming here in just a moment. The follow-up is a Vile. Looks like Hostage Taker is the last card in Merriam's hand. Cavern is naming Illusion in this instance. Looks like one on Human, one on Illusion as we head back over to Brian Basako. David Thomas, a careful observer at this point. Vile going to stay at two here for Basako. He is going to tap for mana. He is going to play a Whirler Rogue. <laughs> Ooh, baby. Whirler Rogue, a card we will take a look at because that's definitely going to change the dynamic of this game. Yeah, it's a, it's a really strong card uh, in, in grindy matchups. A four-mana 2-2 two, two human artificer that creates uh, multiple Thopters when it enters the battlefield. And you can tap two Thopters to make a creature unblockable, I believe. Tap two untapped artifacts you control. Target creature can't be blocked this turn. Now, of course, you don't want to target your Phantasmal Image with that, but you right. are happy to target some other things. But most importantly, he's made some flyers. Now, Basako did, of course, attack for six in the air with those Mantis Riders. So That's true. The Hostage Taker from Ross here is very important because uh, it keeps him from taking lethal next turn. That Whirler Rogue created two more power worth of flying, uh, which does give uh, Basoko uh, eight total power with Ross at eight life. Miriam is going to Phantasmal Image. Oh, that's huge. The Whirler oh, Rogue. that's just game! And now he gets two creatures to be able to make his Champion of the Parish unblockable, perhaps? <laughs> that's uh, That looks like well, that's what's going to happen, if, if you ask me. Now, it looks like maybe Brian has something that he can violin, which is why David Thomas is jumping into the fray here. This is getting a little bit interesting now. Oh, with the tr oh, that's brilliant. That's so smart. So with the Whirler Rogue's trigger on the stack, that's Whirler so Rogue's smart. ability is going to target the Phantasmal Image, then the artifacts resolve, then Ross will be able to win, but not just yet. David Thomas jumped in there real quick, I think, and saved Brian. And now things get a lot more difficult because Ross thought that might be a game winner, where now it is not. And now he doesn't have enough mana to hodge his taker. I think he just lost. I think the game is over. Oh, no, he makes two flyers. So, yeah, he still gets oh, two thopters. Okay. He still gets okay, two thopters. Okay, okay. 
Reset. Now we have a game. Someone stole the thopters. Call the police. Let's get Barbecue Becky up in here. This is very interesting now. That was a great play there by that team. And that's why David Thomas is on the team. <laughs> he saved him right there. I think he was going to let it go. That was huge. That was huge. Thomas Pisacco, Job, Job, excuse me, able to see that line of play. There's your two Thopters. And what's tough here, too, is... Ross had one artifact on the battlefield there in the vial, and Ross, I think, thought that, oh, man, I'm just going to win the game right now. I'm going to copy this War of the Rogue. I'm going to make this champion of the Parish unblockable. You're going to lose the game. Now he's got to rethink everything. And what's even the best attack here? That's hard to say. Yeah, I mean, champion of the Parish can only become 6-6, uh, six, six, and it's probably just going to get chump blocked by the War of the Rogue, if I had to guess. Because the 8-power and Flyers uh, is pretty important, and you don't really want to lose your Phantasmal image. You know... There is a chance he wants to block with the Phantasmal Image Mantis Rider just because next turn is going to die to the uh, Hostage Taker. But that three damage is very important next turn, uh, forcing the two Thopters from Ross into chump block mode. Makes you also wonder what's going on right now in Brian Masoko's hand. He's got a card left there. He's got a vial on two. It's hard to predict exactly what that could be. And Brian's got some real thinking to do, and as does David Thomas. And Jonathan Job can't really help because he's deep in a match against Brendan DeCandio at the moment. So... What will Basako do? A player who is so good in the Human's Mirror and actually has built his deck somewhat to beat the Human's Mirror. You see Whirler Rogue playing a huge role in things, not a card you really ever see. This will be a vile act of, mm, maybe not. Was that a vile bluff? Who knows? As we can tell you one thing, Brendan DeCandio, he ain't bluffing. He wins game number one against Jonathan Joe. Black Blue midrange up a game here over Bant Nexus. I think that's a great matchup for DeCandio. I think he'll probably be able to beat Job in one of these two sideboard games. So for Ross Merriam, if his team, Team BCW, wants to get this, he's got to win this game and this match. What does Brian Basako do here? This is a really tough spot. Uh, I mean, he left the Ether Vol on two, so there's a good chance he has a two in hand. What that two is, uh, you know, matters a lot. Oh. Ooh. Phantasmal image copying Whirler Rogue. Two more Thopters. Wow. Now what? I don't know. Chump block with a Thopter. Okay. So those Thopters are basically on Chump block duty uh, from Ross's side because the Mantis Riders are threatening a ton of damage. Well, I'm not sure that they both have to block. I think only one has to block. Oh, uh, that's true. There is a chance that uh, uh, Basoko uses Aethervile plus the three Thopters to, to make multiple creatures unblockable. Um, but I don't think that's quite enough to get through. If he drew another Mantis Rider, however, I do think it's enough to get it through. All right, so Vile plus this Thopter is going to make the actual Mantis Rider unblockable. So this is going to be an attack here for eight. Maybe. It's possibly just wants to attack with the Mantis Riders. There's a lot of potential damage coming back at him next turn. The problem is if he doesn't present a, a lethal attack, the Thopters just don't have to block. But I think at the same time, I think that Ross is incentivized to try to play as long of a game as he can now because of the hostage taker. This is very, very difficult because if Brian gets too aggressive here, he could end up losing on the counterattack, potentially, depending on what Ross finds. Ross is also interested in keeping his ability to draw another Phantasmal Image and actually activating the Whirler Rogue this go-around as well. Because if he does peel another image, he'll actually have enough artifacts if he manages his resources correctly to make Champion the Parish unblockable. This is an extremely, extremely complicated battlefield right now. One misstep from either player could cause them the entire game and potentially the tournament. All right, 
Looks like we're attacking for eight, putting Ross Miriam to the test. He can't block the original Mantis Rider, but he can chump block and or trade with a Thopter. The problem is if he goes to uh, three or less life, uh, next turn a potential Mantis Rider attack with uh, the, the Whirler Rogue's ability could threaten lethal. So it looks like it might just be three unblockable. Yeah, and that's also fine because if he survives with four artifacts, uh, he can use those four artifacts to make the Mantis Rider and the original Warler Rogue unblockable, which is exactly five. Image is a game winner. Would it not be this? Oh, it wouldn't be the same scenario because of the two Thopters that are currently sitting on the battlefield. Yep. Not sure what Rasha drew. It's possible now he needs to hostage taker the original Mantis Rider because then uh, the Warler Rogue could not target the Phantasmal Image Mantis Rider or else it would die. So what's difficult here is Brian can present lethal next turn. Brian can say, I'll use a Thopter and a Vile, make my Mantis Rider unblockable. I'll use my other two Thopters, make my Warler Rogue unblockable. That's five damage. Yep. That's my entire, you know, battlefield. That's my entire everything. But that's, that's, that's good enough to get the job done. So what that means is that if Ross plays Hostage Taker and makes the obvious play of killing a Phantasmal image, either one, he leaves himself dead. Right. I think he, he understands this. Ross is very good at this uh, this minute combat math and uh, these uh, big board stalls. So I think he's definitely going to Hostage Taker uh, the Mantis Rider since that presents the most amount of damage. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see. Very curious what happens here. And it makes you wonder, too, what's the card that Ross Merriam drew? Because now Ross gets this weird advantage of he's got a vial, and I don't know what's going on with it, and neither does Brian or anybody else on the other side of the battlefield. So Ross is going to make what looks to be the easiest attack and says, I'm going to get in here with a lethal attack with Champion of the Parish. And Brian's got to decide how he wants to block, because there's also another card to weigh into the equation here, which is Reflector Mage. If Brian, for example, blocks with one of those Whirler Rogues, Let's say he blocks with the Fant uh, if he blocks with the actual Warler Rogue, then Phantasmal Mage can take care. Uh, excuse me, Reflector Mage can take care of something. I suppose because Brian's Vial is at three, if you Reflector Mage actual Warler Rogue, he can just bring the Vial up to four. Yeah. But as we run these situations through our head, Todd, you know that Brian, <laughs> David, and John are doing the exact same thing. Oh, absolutely. This is this is crucial. And and these are the not all the types of interaction you see a lot. Whirler Rogue is definitely changing the texture of this game. Uh, Hostage Taker also playing a big role. These are sideboard cards that uh, you don't see a whole lot. The chump block with Whirler Rogue here, I love this. Oh, this is such a good block. So he's jump blocking with the Whirl Rogue because he doesn't really have a way to get Hostage Taker off the battlefield. And Hostage Taker can target that Whirler Rogue. Um, and then uh, next turn, Ross could just cast it and win the game on the spot. So that's an okay block to me. But now, so if, if Ross says, I'm going to play Hostage Taker, and if I play Hostage Taker now, and I target your Phantasmal Image, that means your Whirler Rogue game plan is out. So I'm curious what Ross is going to be targeting here with this Hostage Taker. This is, I don't want to say it's the game, Not but it's close to it. It has to be the Mantis Rider now, now that the chump block on the Whirler Rogue has happened. Especially because Whirler Rogue can't target the Phantasmal Imaged uh, Mantis Rider? Okay. It, it could, but just to clock it. But then the, the Whirler Rogue copy of Phantasmal Image. See, this is really complicated because these cards are all copies of other things. Well, no, what I'm saying is the Whirler Rogue Phantasmal Image cannot target the Phantasmal Image Mantis Rider because it would kill it. Yes. Let's see what this is. This is two copies of Noble Hierarch, and so this is a lethal attack. Yeah, this is an attack for five here with the Mantis Rider, which is going to force a, a chump block with the, the Thopter. However... He could choose to... Ooh. Yeah, I like this. He's making one of these unblockable and attacking for three. Well, it still taps to attack. Yeah. So he taps the, the, the Aether Vial and a Thopter to make a Thopter unblockable, attacks for three Exalted, and has enough creatures to block next turn to survive, and then can just do it again. As long as he has uh, one Noble Hierarch left over, he can just do it again next turn. But he needs to make sure the Phantasmal Image stays in play, this copying the Whirl of Rogue, uh, and uh, at least two Thopters, and the two noble, or one Noble Hierarch. See, my question here is, was Ross supposed to 
was Ross supposed to target the phantasmal imaged Whirler Rogue? Because it seemed like Whirler Rogue was the avenue to victory there for Brian Basako. That's possible. I guess he got a little greedy, maybe thought that the Mantis Rider on his side of the battlefield was a little more desirable. But it's also tough, too, because it was unclear exactly what Brian had in his hand, and two Noble Hierarchs you would think are pretty irrelevant cards, but those Exalted Triggers are very, very powerful with what was found here. So now Ross has even more thinking to do. One of the options, of course, is just casting Mantis Rider from underneath Hostage Taker, but we have no idea what Ross has in his hand right now. This is such a good game, and a tough game from both sides. So Ross is going to cast Mantis Rider, trigger, pump the champion. Now he's got to figure out if he has a good attack here that can present lethal without leaving him dead. I'm very curious what the two cards in his hand are because if they're anything but Reflector Mage or is that Static Caster, he might just be dead. He might need to just swing all out with everything and hope that Basoko blocks with enough stuff that he's unable to, to chain the uh, the Whirler uh, activation uh, as well as the, the Noble Hierarch Exalted. There's five blockers? Yeah, there's five blockers, but he desperately needs to keep the... Uh, the Whirl of Virtuoso Image, as well as one Noble Hierarch. That's his route to victory. Because the Aether Vial plus one token can make another token unblockable. And he needs one pump effect with the Noble Hierarch. It's so easy to just say attack with everything. Let's see what happens. But I don't. that doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> well, if he attacks with everything and sees what happened, uh, Bazooka has the option to just go to one life and block in such a way that it leaves himself with uh, like two power that can just swing back and, and win the game uh, through the Mantis Rider blocking. Well, I guess the Bugler has Vigilance too, so yeah. attacking with everything might just be correct. But he decides to leave back a Thopter. A thopter. Gives him three blockers. And the really tough thing is we have no, legitimately no clue what's in Ross's hand, and neither does Brian. <laughs> That's true. And I actually kind of like not knowing what's in Ross's hand in this instance, because now we get to try to figure out exactly what he's up to from Brian's side of the table. Yeah, so we have to block. Uh, we, c we can take four, but we can't take five. I think he's going to lose too many creatures, so he's not going to be able to uh, use the Whirler plus the Thopters next turn to present lethal. So you obviously got to block the champ. Don't forget, don't forget too, that like Brian is somewhat incentivized to keep his Whirler Virtuoso around, his Whirler uh, Rogue around, which is the Phantasmal Mage. Mm. But he also has an artifact in Vial, right, that he can use to make something unblockable. It's like this hidden, hidden mode on Vial. Right. As long as he has uh, either a Thopter around or a Noble Hierarch around, uh, on top of the Vial and a second Thopter, uh, a Noble Hierarch will win the game. Um, a uh, Dahl's Lieutenant could win the game. But I, honestly, I think he has to block with the other Noble Hierarch or the, the Whirler here. But I think Whirler is his only path to victory. So I think in order to survive, he just has to block with Noble Hierarch and uh, go to two life. The Phantasm is that, that Brian is grabbing at right now, this is a Mantis Rider. Now, of course, they will announce exactly what they are blocking with for clarification. But remember, the one that's at the bottom of the screen is Whirler Rogue. This one is Mantis Rider. So if he puts, let's say uh, he puts uh, the copied Mantis Rider onto the Bugler, uh, his Mantis Rider will survive. He can put the Thopter in front of the uh, the real Mantis Rider, and then he can put the other Noble Hierarch in front of the Champion of the Parish. That'll have Meddling Mage coming through and uh, Thopter coming through and dealing three damage and putting him down to two. And that'll leave him with the Whirler uh, as well as the copied Mantis Rider, but that's it. Now you see David Thomas, ch he chimed in and said, I think our Mantis Rider should try to trade. I think that your Hostage Taker, you got to block that Hostage Taker. you got to block that Bugler. we got to save our Whirler. And see David saying, okay, if we block like this, then we can just attack in the air for three? Yeah, that might be enough. It, it, depending on what Ross has in hand, I feel like if it was a Reflector Mage, he would have done it pre-combat. But who knows? Part of me thinks he would, but part of me thinks he wouldn't. Like David found the block in such a way that uh, it's the obvious onboard win, but 
that excludes Ross having drawn m anything at all. He plays the planes and passes the turn back, so he's got to have something here. Something that costs three that he can put in the playoff of Vile. That is going to do it. David uh, Thomas, uh, Brian Basoko, and Jonathan Job are going to win this game and match over Tan and Grace, Ross Merriam, and Brendan DeCandio, Jonathan Job, Brian Basako. They are the first two time team constructed champions here on the SCG Tour. And you can see the anguish there on Tan and Grace and Ross Merriam. They were so close once again.